If you know me, you probably know that I have a lot of classification problems. Some in my personal life, but mostly at work. I started from just running a list of classifiers. And while some work better in some cases, and others are better for other cases, XGPost consistently performs very good. I was really excited to see that because XGBoost is a tree-based model, and I really like trees. In nature, of course, but also in machine learning. They're really easy to understand, you know, the kind of machine learning model you can tell your mom about. So I wanted to understand how XGBoost works and why it performs so well. My name is Yama Nina Mino, and I'm a data scientist and a musician. I work at MyPart, a startup in the music industry. Today, I'm going to share with you my journey with tree-based classifiers while tackling the problem of classifying songs into different genres. The first thing we're going to talk about is the data set and the process of extracting features from songs. Then we're going to see how to build a decision tree and how it performs in this case of genre classification. Then we'll talk a little bit about random forest and dive into XGBoost and see how they improved our results. And we'll finish with a comparison to other machine learning models. So why should we even talk about genre classification? Tagging of genres can be used to create automatic playlists. It can help when searching for songs. It can assist in placing songs in commercials and movies and so on. Today, it is mostly done manually. And as such, it's a slow process that is prone to errors. Machine learning based tags has the potential to reduce time, improve accuracy, and of course, handle larger catalogs of songs. There are many ways to build a data set for the problem of genre classification. The data set we will see today is from Kaggle. We have four genres, pop, metal, blues, and classical music with 100 samples from each genre. The features were extracted using Librosa, which is a Python package used for music and audio analysis. The features we're using are rhythm features and spectral features, which are features that are based on the frequency of the signal. Rhythm features include the estimated tempo, which is the speed of the song. That can be extracted from a tempogram. On the y-axis, we have the BPM, bits per minute, which is the way we measure tempo. The x-axis is the time. Here we can see how the tempi, which is the plural of tempo, changes over time. Spectral features include the spectral centroid, which is the weighted mean of the frequencies in the signal, with their magnitudes as the weights. For some of you, it might make sense to think about it as the center of mass of the spectrum. So how do we get those frequencies and magnitudes? We have a very nice function called Fourier transform that extracts the frequencies from a given signal. Of course, there's a lot more to get into all of this, but for today, we'll just have a look at a very short code snippet so that you can see how easy it is to extract those two features and many others. First of all, of course, we need to import Liposa and then load our audio file. Here I'm using some example audio they provide. Then we get SR, the sample rate, which means how many samples are recorded per second, and Y, which is a NumPy array that describes the amplitude at each sample. Then we can extract many different features, like the two we mentioned, and for each of them, we just need to provide the relevant function with Y and the sample rate. So we can get the estimated tempo and the spectral centroid, as you can see in the next couple of lines. Now, the spectral centroid would also be a NumPy array. And if we want a single value as a feature per song, we can choose its mean, for example. So now that we have the features and the classes sorted, let's talk about decision trees. A decision tree asks questions and then separates the data by the answers. For example, if we want to build a decision tree for a binary classification between metal songs and non-metal songs, we can ask if the song is very loud. And since most metal songs are loud, we'll have more metal songs on the left 
and more non-metal songs on the right. But metal songs are more than just loud. And we can also ask questions that their answers are not binary. For example, if we want to ask something about how fast the song is, we can use the BPM we mentioned earlier, beats per minute, and we can ask if the song's BPM is larger than 100. And since most metal songs are faster than that, that should give us better separation between the classes. The first split is called the root node of the tree. Other splits are called nodes, and the final classification is coming from the leaf nodes, where we see the classes metal and not metal. So at each point, we want to find the best split for the tree. What does it mean, the best? The one with the lowest impurity. A leaf is called pure if the samples that reach it are all from the same class. For example, if we look at all the songs that are not loud, we have 10 metal songs and 19 non-metal songs. So the probability of a song that reaches that leaf to be a metal song is 0.1 and the probability of the song that reaches that leaf to not be a metal song is 0.9. And we can add these probabilities to every leaf node. And we can see that only one leaf classifying songs as not metal is pure, which means that in our data set, all songs that are loud and slow are not metal songs. While the two other leaves are impure, since they consist of both metal and non-metal songs. There are many ways to measure impurity. A common one is called Gini. In classification problems, the Gini impurity of a leaf is calculated using the probabilities of a sample that reached that leaf to be in each class. In our case, the Gini impurity of a leaf is 1 minus the probability of being a metal song squared minus the probability of not being a metal song squared. So we can calculate the Gini impurity for each leaf node. Trust me, I've calculated it for you. These are the numbers we get. The next stage is to calculate the Gini impurity for using a specific feature and a specific threshold for the split. And this is equal to the weighted average of the leaf node impurities. The weights are the ratio of songs in each leaf so that if one leaf consists of more songs, it will get more weight. So if the leaves under the BPM split consist of the same number of songs, the Gini impurity for using the feature BPM and the threshold 100 is 0.21. And if we calculate the Gini impurity for a split with the same feature BPM, but a different threshold 70, we'll see that the leaves will be less pure and the Gini impurity of that split will be higher. So we should choose the threshold 100 over the threshold 70. So for every split we want to add, we just have to go through all of the options for the splits, calculate the Gini impurity, and choose the best one. If we have a binary feature or a categorical one, it's easy to go through all of the options. But if we have a numeric one, it sounds a bit confusing because we can't go over all of the numbers. One thing we can do is order all the values in this feature, calculate the average between each two values, and use th those averages as the potential values for splits. So in this case, we will use the values 99, 110, 126, and 142.5 as the potential values for the split. So now that we know how to build a decision tree, let's see how it performs on our classification problem. And remember that it's classifying songs into four genres and not just metal. So we got 81% accuracy, which is very nice, but I'm sure we can do better than that. So let's have a look at the popular tree-based classifier, Random Forest. As the name suggests, Random Forest uses multiple trees. It combines them with bagging, to improve accuracy, reduce variance, and avoid overfitting. Bagging means bootstrapping and aggregating. And bootstrapping is a resampling method that we use to create multiple datasets out of our original dataset. We're sampling our original dataset randomly with replacement, 
So we can choose the same sample more than once. As you can see in this illustration, in the original data set, there are five blue samples. Let's say they are pop songs. And in the bootstrap data sets, there can be only one pop song and there can be even seven pop songs. Then we build our decision tree and each tree will be trained on a different data set. Limiting the number of features is another method we use to make sure we get a wide variety of trees, which makes random forest more effective than individual decision trees. At each step in the process of building each tree, we'll only use a random subset of features. So how many features will be a part of this random subset? Well, we can change the number of features and choose the one that gives us the best results. Typically, we'll start from the square root of the number of features and then try some options around that. The same feature can be used multiple times in the same tree. When we randomly select this subset of features, we do that out of the full features list that we have. So now that we have a lot of different trees, we want to combine their predictions. We run a song in all of the trees and choose the majority vote. So if three trees say that the song is a metal song and one says that the song is not a metal song, then the prediction of the random forest is that this is a metal song. Of course, we want more than four trees. We actually want around 100 trees. Because each tree is trained on a unique data set and a unique set of features, we can say that each tree specializes in some specific niche. And when we combine the predictions, the noise of the trees that this is not their specialty cancel each other out. And that's how we're left with better predictions. Now I mentioned some numbers here, like the number of features or the number of trees. They are all hyperparameters that can be optimized to get the best results. The last thing we'll say about random forest is regarding how to evaluate it. Since we train the trees on the bootstrap datasets, for each tree, we have some samples that were not a part of its data set. We call the samples that were not used to create the tree, the out-of-bag data set. For each sample, we run it in every tree that didn't use it. And then again, we take the majority vote. So then we have predictions for each one of our out-of-bag samples. And we can look at the proportion of out-of-bag samples that were incorrectly classified by the random forest which is called out-of-bag error. So now let's see how did the random forest perform on our genre classification. We got 87% accuracy, which is great improvement, but can we do even better? So the tree-based model that improved the results the most was XGBoost. XGBoost means extreme gradient boosting. Boosting is an ensemble method that helps reduce bias and variance. It converts weak learners, which are models that are just better than random guessing, like decision trees, to strong ones, which are models that are much better than random guessing, like XGBoost. If we're doing a binary classification, trying to predict if a song is metal or not, the values of the labels are one for metal songs and zero for non-metal songs. Of course, we have more features and more songs than what we see in this table. Xtubo starts by giving one initial prediction for all of the samples, the same prediction, and its default value is 0.5. So the default prediction is that there is a 50% chance that the song is a metal song. Then we calculate the residuals, the difference between the labels and the prediction. So for metal songs, we get 1 minus 0.5, which is 0.5. And for non-metal songs, we get 0 minus 0.5, which is minus 0.5. And we call them our new labels. And then we build the first tree. That tree tries to predict the new labels. So let's get some intuition regarding how to predict the labels now that they're numbers and not classes like we saw before. If we split by loudness, we look at all the songs that are not loud, and the prediction we put in the right leaf is the average label of these songs. In this case, it's one song, and its label is minus 0.5. 
Then when we split by BPM, again, we get on the right leaf one song that its label is minus 0.5. On the left leaf, we get two metal songs and one non-metal song. So the prediction is the average of 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and minus 0 0.5, which is 0 0.167. The exact calculations for the output values of the leaves are a bit more complicated than that, and also include converting between log of the odds and the probability. But don't worry if that doesn't mean anything to you. It's just a different formula. Just like we saw in the decision tree, we have a measure that helps us choose the best split. This time, it's trying to minimize the residuals, the difference between the label and the prediction that results from each split. Unlike what we saw in the decision tree, when we go over the potential splits, we're not ordering the values and calculating the averages, because when we have a lot of data, this will make the process of building each tree very slow. And XGBoost is designed to work efficiently with a lot of data. So instead, XGBoost calculates the quantiles of the feature and uses about 33 quantiles as the potential values for splits. Meaning, we divide the values to 33 groups with equal sizes and take the maximum value of each group. There are different ways to calculate quantiles, but when the data set is big enough, the results are the same. So when we want to use that tree for prediction, we add its prediction to the initial prediction. So if a song is fast and loud, its prediction will be 0.5 plus 0.167, which is 0.667. And that is the general concept. Every time we calculate the new residuals, which are the label minus the prediction, and build a new tree that tries to predict those residuals. And for prediction, we add the initial prediction to the prediction of each one of the following trees. Each tree gets us a little bit closer to the real value. So actually, we're not just adding all of these predictions as they are, but also scaling them by a learning rate, which is a parameter called eta. And its default value is 0 0.3. So what is a learning rate and why do we need it? We said that each tree takes us one step closer to the real value. The learning rate says what is the size of the step we're taking. The smaller the step is, the closer we can get to the best model, but it's slower computationally because we have to take a lot of steps. For example, if there's ice cream one meter and 43 centimeters away from me, and my step size is one meter long, the closest I can get to the ice cream is 43 centimeters away after taking one step. But if my step size is 10 centimeters long, I can take 14 steps and get three centimeters away from the ice cream. And of course, if my step size is one centimeter long, then I can get exactly to where the ice cream is and eat all of it. Just like in life, we can improve tremendously by taking a lot of small steps towards our goals. And it's not just inspirational, it results in lower variance, so we'll perform better on different data sets. The last subject I'm going to talk about regarding XGBoost is pruning. Pruning is the process of deleting splits from the tree. Doing that helps us reduce the complexity of the tree, improve accuracy, and reduce overfitting. In XGBoost, after we finish building each tree, we move to the stage of pruning that tree. When we built the tree, we calculated the gain, which is sort of similar to the guinea we mentioned in the decision tree that helped us pick the best feature and threshold for each split. Now we use the gain to decide if we're keeping that split or pruning it. We choose a threshold, and if the gain is below that threshold, we prune the split, else we keep it. If we prune a split, then we will go backwards up the branch, and test the split above it as well. It's possible to have a split with a smaller gain as a parent of a split with a higher gain. And that's what's nice about pulling after the tree is completely built. We won't miss that lower split with the higher gain, even though its parent has lower gain. So we talked about the initial prediction XGBoost gives, the trees that predict the residuals, 
scaling the predictions by the learning rate, and pruning the trees after they are built. As you can see, XGBoost builds each tree based on the previous one, in contrary to Random Forest, which builds each tree independently. Of course, there's a lot more to say about XGBoost, regularization and optimizations, but for now, let's talk about performance. I ran XGBoost on my dataset of Dunmore classification and got the amazing improvement of 92% accuracy. Much better. Remember the two features I mentioned in the beginning, Tempo and Spectral Centroid? When I looked at the feature importance of these models, I noticed the decision tree didn't use them at all, while XGBoost and Random Forest used all of the features. So just a few points of comparison between tree-based models and other models. One good point to start with is interpretability, since it's such a hot topic. Tree-based models are easier to interpret than many other models. SHEP, for example, which is a library used to explain individual predictions, has a specific solution for tree-based models, which is faster and more accurate than the solutions for other models. Also, it's easy to get feature importance from tree-based models, and sometimes not so easy from other models. Another subject that is a sore spot for many people in the industry is the amount of data needed. Tree-based models require less training data than neural networks, for example. And lastly, to make sure you don't think tree-based models are perfect, they only work on tabular data and not on other data types. So you can't use it for raw data, like image, text, or audio. So what did we learn today? We started from talking about genre classification, how you can build a data set for the problem, and more importantly, the potential that exists in using machine learning in the music industry. We talked about feature extraction from songs, specifically rhythm features and spectral features, and saw some code snippets for extracting those features using the fact the Bosa. So now you know that you don't have to be an audio expert to analyze songs. Then we talked about decision trees, how they are built and the process of choosing the best split using the Guinea impurity. After that, we saw how we can use an ensemble of trees to improve our results. We talked about random forest and bagging and about XGBoost, the residuals, the quantiles, the pruning, and of course, how we can improve by taking a lot of small steps towards our goals. Finally, trees are fun. We talked about some points of comparison between tree-based models and other machine learning models, interpretability, the data set size, and the data type, and saw that you shouldn't rule out using tree-based models just because they sound simple. Now we can all go back to running XGBoost and enjoying the good results when we understand a bit better how it works. You're welcome to contact me on LinkedIn and thank you for listening.